to our session on patterns of organization in academic writing. So our goal today is to for you to be able to choose a method of organizing for your paper that will fit the assignment and your writing style. Um, and the first thing you have to know when you're doing a paper is what's your writing purpose? Why are you writing this? And you can find that by checking your assignment. Double check very carefully what your assignment is that your instructor has given you. There are four general purposes for writing that we have. I'm going to go through each one of them very quickly. One of them is the narrative purpose. And that's when you are trying to tell a story about something. So you might use a narrative to write a personal account of something. The teacher asks you to tell about an event in your life. How did you come to be here? Why did you come to college? Anything that has some sort of story involved in it, that would be a narrative. Another thing is something that's descriptive. Descriptive is when you need to give details about what something looks like, which is primarily what it's used for but it might be what it sounds like, smells like, tastes like, or feels like. The other one is called expositive, and that's one of the more frequent kinds of assignments that you're going to get in academic writing. And that's where you explain something. And finally, there's the persuasive argument, and that's where you want to convince your reader of something that you have probably researched or a point of view that you have. So when you're doing the writing process, there are several steps. You gather ideas, you organize them, you draft, you revise, you edit, and finally you publish when you send it in. We're going to just talk today about the organizing part. So you're not really writing at this point. You're taking the information that you have gathered together and you're going to put it together in some order in order to allow you to write. For me, this is some sort of an outline or jotting down of even bullet points so that I can see how I'm going to put that together. When we think about an essay, an academic essay, there are three main parts. There's an intro, there's the body, and there's the conclusion. We're only today going to talk about how we organize the body paragraph. The introduction and conclusion are two separate kinds of paragraphs, very different in the way that they are put together. They're very specialized. So I'm just going to talk about body paragraphs today. So one method that you might use is chronological. Chronological is in the order of time. And we oftentimes use that for a personal narrative or when we're summarizing something. What was the order that that came in? And the transitions that you use, here are just some examples, before, first, during, soon, or be one. Something that shows the passage of time. So here's an example of a chronological paragraph. I'm going to read it out loud, and I'm going to ask you to think about which words are the ones that help move the paragraph along in time. The morning of my big job interview started like any other. I awoke determined and confident in getting a new job with Williams Moving and Storage. Rising from bed, I felt stronger like a rodeo bull waiting to get out of his cage. Soon I was sitting at the kitchen table eating my Wheaties. I started looking at the furniture around me in a new light. A height of bed in the living room was a 300-pound finger-eating monster opening and closing, snapping it. Next, I looked out onto the crowded, the covered patio. It seemed that the wicker furniture was floating, almost drifting by itself to the front door. Suddenly, I knew that moving furniture was my calling. As I walked to the front door, I gave the height of it a good stiff so if you look back at this paragraph, you notice that there are several words that help move us along in time. And we want to, to find those words. How do the certain words help it, this, the sentences flow together in time? Morning. And if you keep on reading, 
it started, right? So we're knowing at the beginning. Awoke, usually you do that first thing in the morning, correct? And if you move on, soon, next, suddenly, and finally, as. So that you're getting a sense of time passing as you're reading through the paragraph. And that's, it's the transitions that help you do that. Help you see how the time is passing. So another format that you might use is what we call sequential. It's so closely related to chronological. They're almost twins, but not quite. Sequential also tells things in a time order, but it's more used for giving instructions or giving a process. And many of the words are the same. First, next, then, while, finally. But if I show you an example, you'll see the slight difference between a sequential and a chronological paragraph. I'm going to read this one to you again. Having a great looking chest is easier than most people think, and it starts with doing a flat bench press. <coughs> Start with approximately 60% of your body weight. While lying on your back on the bench, grab the bar firmly with both hands so they line up with the ends of your shoulders. Then push the bar up to release it from the holder, extending your arms upward. Avoid fully locking your arms. Next, bring the bar down slowly until it touches your chest. Now you should push the bar back up at twice the speed it was brought down. Do 10 repetitions and then take a two minute rest. This completes one set. Add more weight if you need and complete three more sets. After several weeks, your chest muscles will increase dramatically in size and you'll be ready for the beach. So do you see how this one tells how to do things in a step-by-step -step order? It's still chronological, but it's more closely focused to how to do something. So if you were doing a recipe or telling me how to fix something, you would use the more sequential ones. So here's some of the words. Start. Did you notice that one? Do you see another one? Why? Do you see the next one that starts the next sentence? Then. Next. Now. Then again, notice that this one's not at the beginning of the sentence. Many times people think that they only go at the beginning, but they can be used in the middle or someplace else in the sentence. Uh, three more, telling you you're continuing after several weeks. So another one, another method of organization is what we call the spatial method. And so that's when you have to write a description of something and you're, you're going to show someone in words what something looks like or sounds like or feels like, tastes like. So many times in a report, nurses have to describe what something looked like when they come into a room. Um, officers have to describe a crime scene. Um, you have to, to be able to describe what something is like. And that's done spatial. We have to be very careful that the person can follow what we're talking about. If I'm describing the room, I want to start in one spot and I want to move all around the room, not start with what's on the front wall, what's on the back wall, and what's on the ceiling, and then more about the back wall. That's very confusing to someone who's trying to visualize it or make a movie in their head. So the spatial ones are words that help you show the relationship of one thing to the next, like next to, inside, near, below, behind. They show the relationship between the two words. So here's a spatial paragraph. My first apartment was a faded brown building on a busy street in downtown Vancouver. I entered by walking down a dimly lit narrow hallway covered in worn green carpeting. So you can see, here's the entrance. When I say apartment, I really mean room because it was just one small square room with a tiny bathroom. Now you've got an idea of what the inside looks like, right? To the right of the door was a kitchen that consisted of a few shabby paste painted wood cupboards that projected into the room and a tiny avocado colored stove and fridge. That's to the right, right? Now to the back wall. Against the back wall, a small red card table with two chairs served as my kitchen and dining room table. 
Above the table was a small window that provided a perfect view of the brown stucco wall of the building next door. Along the wall to the left was an old pale blue sofa, which was also my bed. A few feet away, several large cardboard moving boxes contained all of my clothes and personal possessions. The one bright spot was the large poster of a winter mountain scene which I had hung on the dull gray wall behind my sofa. It helped me survive the eight months I called this dull home. So if this person had just started telling you about the table and then the poster and then the brown rug and then the window, it would be pretty confusing. But because she walked you in, gave you an idea of what it looked like, and then let you see around the whole room by the way she chose to organize the things that she put in, or he, um, you get an idea of what the room looks like. It helps you make that movie. So here's some of the transitions to the right, against the back wall, above the table. See, they're showing relationships to the words. Along the wall, if you feel away, behind. Those are the words that really help you see where one thing is in relationship to the previous. Another method, and this is oftentimes what an assignment is asked to do, is to compare two ideas, two people, two points of view, two... Um, I just worked with someone not long ago comparing a story that was made into a movie and how was the story and the movie similar and different. So when you compare two things, there are two main methods that we use. One is called the point-by-point -point method, and I'm going to show you something that's in point-by-point. -point. And the other one's in block method, and I'll also show you a block method one. You use the same transitions for both, but it's just in how you organize them. So let's look first at the point-by-point -point method. And this one's about, can you tell by the... the uh, you can tell here it's about cars and buses, comparing cars and buses. And so you can kind of see that in point by point, we have an idea, we talk about it with cars, then we talk about it with buses. Then we have another idea, we talk about it with cars, and we talk about it with buses. Then we have another idea, we talk about it with cars and then buses. That's point by point. So, here's an example. When faced with the choice of driving your own car or using the bus, the majority of North Americans opt for cars. So there's that topic sentence that tells what you're comparing. And now it's going to go into making sure that it always compares every aspect, one and then the other. They do not mind that owning and running a car is expensive when compared to the cost of monthly or annual transit passes in most cities. Now transit here refers to what you would use in a bus. That's another kind of a word for bus. In addition to the initial cost of a car, there is gas, repairs, insurance, and parking, which add to thousands of years, while a typical bus pass is about $50 a month. Yet most people are willing to pay this price for the convenience of owning a car. They enjoy the freedom of coming and going according to their own whims. They are not simply they are simply not willing to put up with waiting for buses that stop far from their homes and are often parked, packed with uncounted strangers. Cars are comfortable and personal spaces in contrast to the grungy and impersonal feeling of many buses. But as they motor happily along, few car owners even think about what their personal vehicle is doing to them. Do they know that a loaded bus creates much less pollution per person than a car? Unfortunately, until there is a huge change in the attitude of car owners towards using public transit, cars will continue to rule the roads and our environment and our cities to pay the cars. So you can see that in this one, because it's point by point, the very first one is the cost. So it talks about cost of car, cost of bus. Then it talks about freedom, freedom car, freedom bus. Talks about comfort, freedom, um, for comfort with the car, then with the bus, and all the way through. That's the point by point method of organizing. 
And for some kinds of assignments that you might do, point by point makes works the best. However, there's another method that you can use, and that's called the block method. In the block method, you talk all about one thing, and then you talk all about the other thing. So this is the same idea, but reorganized. So it's a choice that you get to make as an author. So here, so you can see how this one, it, you can actually see on the, hand, on the PowerPoint here, North American uh, clearly prefer driving their own cars to using public transport. Port in many ways, they desire to own a car. The desire to own a car is easy to understand. Cheap cars are expensive to buy and run. Car payments, gas, insurance. Do you see how that whole talk is about cars? And then when I move down, the unlike is where it starts to change. Unlike. Unlike car owners. And a change, now we're just going to talk about buses. Unlike car owners, bus riders are prepared to make some sacrifices to save money. So that method that then continues to just talk about buses in the second half is part of the block method. And depending on what you're writing, you're going to pick the one that works best for you and your assignment. Another thing that's often, another kind of assignment that's often made in colleges is to write a cause and effect paper. Sometimes you're focusing more on the causes. Sometimes you might be focusing more on the effects. Typical transitions are listed right here that can be used. Thus, as a result, for this reason, therefore, due to, so you're showing the relationship between two ideas. So here's one that's a cause and effect with a focus on the causes. While credit cards are convenient and easy to use, the misuse of credit cards can lead to serious problems. Why? So it's going to tell causes. Why? Many consumers spend beyond their ability to pay, leading to a serious to serious financial difficulties or bankruptcy. One reason for consumers overspending is aggressive promotion by credit card companies. Fancy commercials and advertisements create the image that using credit cards is easy, trendy, and prestigious. They offer tempting, tempting low introductory rates and other benefits. Can you see how that's all giving causes? It's just listing some causes and explaining them. Instead of worrying about payment with high interest rates, card users tend to find immediate satisfaction in fulfilling their desires. Many people seem unaware that credit cards are not free. People may not feel like they are spending money, but they are creating debts that have to be paid. They often lose track of how much they are spending. To avoid problems with credit card debt, people need to become educated in personal financial management. Unfortunately, this kind of information isn't as easily available to consumers as credit card advertisements that promote the freedom benefits of credit card use. So just a whole thing so that it's, it's talking about the, an effect and the things that cause that. Can you see that? You can also have it focus on the effect of something. So here's one that starts off with talking about how what happens because of something else. Drug addiction is a serious health issue that affects addicts, their families, and society. First of all, drug addiction has severe physical effects on the addict's body. Drug users can experience many physical symptoms including sickness, fever, sweats, and shakes, loss of appetite, and weight loss. They also face the danger of contracting serious diseases such as AIDS, hepatitis, and other communicable diseases, not to mention the risk of overdose. Families and friends of drug addicts are inevitably also affected by their addiction. Addiction can lead to serious financial problems, loss of trust, and eventually family breakup and divorce. Society as well play, pays a cost. Crime rates go up and more security and hospital care is needed, which are all paid for by taxpayers. Drug addiction is a destructive way to live. Maybe more would be done about it if it were looked at as not if it were looked at not just as a problem that addicts face alone, but as something that affects society as a whole. So once again, we 
you've got a cause-effect paragraph, but the focus is on the effect. The problem is the, um, the drug addiction, and these are all the effects that happen because of it. Another one is um, talking a lot of times in a, in a class in college we'll be asked to talk about a problem and a solution. And so some of the transitions that you might use, the problem is, as a solution, one answer ultimately in the end, something that moves things along that you show the difference between what's the problem and what's the solution. So here's an example from malnutrition. Malnutrition is a big health issue in Niger. Niger is located in Africa close to the equator. It has extremely high daytime temperatures and very little rainfall. Yearly droughts threaten food production. As a result, many people starve. With 10 million people to feed, they need a more reliable food supply. The challenge for people living in Niger is to develop hardy, drought-resistant crops. With ample food supplies, the people of Niger would experience better health. So you've got the problem, malnutrition, and the solution by the end, which is to have developed crops that give them ample food supplies. And it wasn't a really long paragraph either, but it still got us there. The last one I'm going to talk about today is the order of importance. Sometimes when you're talking about something, you have several different ideas, and you might put them in the order of first most important to least important, or you might start with least important and go and with most important, which is my favorite way to do it. Um, but when you do that, you need to clue the person in who's, who's reading What's most important, what's first, what's second, um, next, finally, another. And those are all transitions that you can use in your paper. So here's an example. Although a few, although few circumstances make us as nervous as speaking in public does, there are some simple ways to cope. For one thing, use visual aids or handouts if possible to take the focus off you. Also, have a glass of water handy. This serves two purposes. It's a prop, and it helps to keep the mouth moist for easy speaking. In addition, stand behind a desk or podium or sit at a table. You'll feel and look more relaxed than if you were freestanding. Last, and perhaps most important, be yourself. Adopting a more formal style will make you and your, and your audience less comfortable. So it went from least or least important down to what's most important there. The last one shows the, the order of importance. So those are methods. Now in one essay you might have a body paragraph that's kind of logical and you might have another part paragraph that's comparing. It just kind of depends upon what your purpose for writing is. As you're working through a whole essay you're going to have um, many different ways that would organize in the body paragraphs. Okay. If you need more help, you know where you can come and get help. Come into our um, reading, writing, writing, reading, and speech assistance area, and we would be glad to help you check over or help you get organized with your paper.